Welcome back to Case of the Sunday Scaries. I'm Elise, and my goodness, does it feel so good to finally be saying that again. I took a little bit to figure out these next steps since Annie's departure, and I already missed playing detective with her in the studio, but I'm really excited for this next chapter. For those tuning in on YouTube, hi, how are you? This is crazy. Here I am in 4K. It's very good to see you. You look incredible today. You're killing it pun intended, of course, and I am so excited to be sharing the video version of this podcast. If you are watching on YouTube, please take a second, hit the subscribe button, and help this channel grow. I'm a one-woman show, researching, producing, and editing these episodes, so audio listeners will get their episodes on Sunday, as always, but the video version will be coming later in the week. Before we get started, I want to remind you that I do my absolute best to provide factual information based on public sources, and I use that research to form my own opinion. I'm only human, right? But it is just that, my opinion, and it is certainly not meant to harm anyone discussed in these episodes. I never know exactly how to give trigger warnings. After all, this is a true crime podcast, so by nature, I'm going to have discussions around troubling topics. But I do want to warn you, this episode contains audio clips that are seriously disturbing. I have done my best to remove the victim's voice as much as possible from the recording because I want to preserve her dignity. As always, when I share particularly difficult content, I'm going to include timestamps in the description box if you just want to skip over that section. This episode will also have discussion of racism, sexual assault, and torture. If any of those topics are particularly sensitive to you, You take care of you. I will see you back here for another episode that's better suited. With all that said, let's get into today's case. Today, I'm covering the case of Brian Stephen Smith, the unlikely hero who would end up bringing him to justice, and the two Native Alaskan women who we know tragically lost their lives to him. It's also my belief that there is many more that can be linked to him. This is the case of the SD card killer. If you've been following this podcast for a while, you know I like to do a deep dive. I want to know everything I can about these perpetrators, especially their childhood and adolescent years. While I'm never going to be able to give a why to the senseless, awful things they do later in life, their childhood often gives context or at least indicators for who they would later become. However, because this case didn't get a whole lot of media coverage, there's not a whole lot I could find about Brian Smith's early years. What I do know about Brian Smith was that he was born in the Eastern Cape, but grew up in Queenstown, South Africa. I also know that Brian Smith was a racist piece of, well, you know. They say hate is not born, it's learned. But honestly, how would Brian Smith learn this given where he grew up? Didn't make sense to me until I did a bit more digging into what was going on in South Africa during that time. The 2022 census estimates that about 81.4% of the population of South Africa is Black or Indigenous South Africans. Only 5.6 of the population is white. So you would think, obviously, growing up in this environment, that you would learn to appreciate the culture of the majority. Unfortunately, that was wishful thinking on my part. Honestly, I could and probably will do an entire episode just on the apartheid in South Africa. But for now, I want you to understand that before Brian Smith was even born, until the early 1990s, there was a system of institutionalized racial segregation called the apartheid that ensured that South Africa was ruled economically, politically, socially, just everything, was ruled by the tiny minority of white South Africans. Citizens were classified by race groups. White citizens had the highest status, followed by Indians, then people of mixed race or just anything that wasn't white or black. And last on that list, black people, you know, the ones that make 86% of the population. So frustrating. Actual laws were passed in the early 1950s in South Africa, banning not only marriage, but even sexual relations between different races. Honestly, again, I could go on and on about this, but this episode would end up being five hours long, so we're going to save it for another episode. But you might be wondering, okay, this was a great history lesson, but why is this so important to this case? Well, Brian Smith was born in South Africa on March 23rd, 1971. So it's not much of a stretch to believe that in a place with so much racial divide between white people and literally every other race, that he learned from a very young age to look down on 
anyone that did not look like him. He would have been indoctrinated with beliefs that white people were superior to basically everyone. And I was shocked to see photos so clearly segregating public spaces by race. This first picture is of a woman leaving a bus station bathroom with a sign above it that reads, Blacks, Coloreds, and Asians. This photo was taken in 1986 in South Africa. 1986! This isn't something that's in black and white. It's not hundreds of years ago. This is, well, geez, what year are we in? It wasn't that long ago. I'm 36. I was born a year after this picture was taken. The next photo of a beautiful beach with men soaking up the sun has a posted sign that reads, this bathing area is reserved for the sole use of members of the white race group. This photo was also taken in 1986. And I just can't get over the fact that this was happening during my lifetime. It seems incomprehensible. Brian Smith would have grown up surrounded by this disgusting rhetoric, these signs all over the place, basically reinforcing that white people were better than everyone else and needed these special beaches and special restrooms and all of this nastiness. He would have been surrounded by all of this racial segregation for the majority of his young life. He would have been in his early 20s when the apartheid ended, but I highly doubt the change in legislation would lead to a change of heart in him. In fact, I know it didn't, but we're going to circle back to that in a bit. Brian Smith served in the Army and then worked a whole bunch of odd jobs. A colleague of Brian's named Adrian, who worked with him for a time at a software company, told People Magazine, quote, I would have never guessed. He was one of the more pleasant people I've known. I don't think I've seen him angry or even raise his voice or anything, end quote. He only worked for that software company for about a year before he left to manage guest houses, basically South Africa's version of a bed and breakfast. He also went on to say that Brian didn't stick around anywhere a long time, and I'm sure he didn't, because maybe then, if he had just hung out for a little longer than a year or two in one area, people would see behind his friendly facade to the absolute monster that Brian Smith really was. In everything I researched, it said that Brian Smith did not have any run-ins with the law in South Africa. Yet call it woman's intuition or just common sense, but I'm a wee bit skeptical that there might be more to the story. Think about it. Could you imagine? Let's just imagine you're walking up to a seemingly well-adjusted child or teen and say, hey, young man, what do you want to be when you grow up? And they look at you with those beautiful big child eyes and say, you know, I think I'm going to become a killer. Maybe I'm going to aim high and become a serial killer. That just, it, that doesn't happen. The reality is that most serial killers follow a pattern of escalation. Many of them start off as peeping toms because they're going to test and cross the boundaries of what we would think of social norms. And frankly, consider the context of everything we just discussed about what was going on in South Africa during Brian's adolescence. This was a time of political and social upheaval. Do you think anyone would have reported if they saw the neighbor kid peeking through a window? Maybe. But with everything we know now, do we really think a young white boy would have received more than a slap on the wrist? Probably not. And maybe I'm reaching. I'll own it if I am. But I personally find it really hard to believe that someone who would eventually become known as the SD card killer had absolutely no hint of darkness in his past. I think it's just that he never got caught or reported. Brian Smith met his future wife, a bluegrass musician named Stephanie, on an online gaming website. The two started up a romance, got engaged in 2013, and the following year, he made the leap to not only get married, but move all the way from South Africa to be with her in Anchorage, Alaska. He had dreams of opening up his own hotel, which is a bone-chilling thought when you find out the details of this case. Stephanie would say in interviews that her husband was very doting, very loving, but you know what else she said when speaking to KTUU News? Wow, try saying that 10 times fast. He also enjoyed taking solo trips all over Alaska. Occasionally, he would go out on these long drives or just explore why she preferred to stay home. Now, before you go thinking anything about Stephanie, she has been cleared of any involvement in her husband's crimes. We are not going to blame Stephanie for the sins of her husband. I just want you to keep her words in the back of your mind, though, about how much Brian loved 
frolicking all over Alaska. Alone. You know what I am giving Stephanie the side eye for, though? Stephanie, whose Facebook states that she used to work as an administrative officer at the U.S. Immigration and Naturalization Service in Anchorage? I just can't help but wonder how Stephanie ended up marrying a racist asshat like Brian Smith. Remember when I said we'd circle back to how I knew Brian was a racist piece of... Mm -hmm. Well, we're here. Here we are. I'm going to go out on a limb and assume that being married and all, Stephanie was probably friends with her husband on Facebook. They did, after all, post quite a few pictures together. So she would have seen the multiple racist, bigoted posts that he made and the articles that he shared all over his feed. She would have seen them because it certainly wasn't hard for me to find them. And I've never had the misfortune of knowing Brian Smith personally. I normally would not even want to read this type of nonsense out loud. However, in this case, it really is important to know Brian Smith's inner thoughts because I do not think it is a coincidence who he later would target. On September 16th, 2014, after he had already moved to Alaska and married his wife, Brian shared an article from a website. The article was titled, quote, Mandela's Rainbow Nation, Stoning in the Street by Hate-Filled Blacks in South Africa, end quote. And above this shared article, he thought he should go ahead and caption it with his own personal thoughts. Again, please know that these are his words, not mine. He wrote, quote, Please keep sending money to the blacks in Africa so they can buy soap to wash the blood off their hands. The black Africans are only this blatant about their racism towards whites, because we have all these bleeding heart whites who feel sorry for these savages, end quote. I don't even like reading that stuff out loud, but if that wasn't alarming enough, when I tried to revisit the article now mysteriously taken down, I got to Googling and I visited the site that the article originated from. And I'm not going to name the site on this podcast because, frankly, they don't deserve the web traffic. And if your phone's listening to you, I don't want anything of that nature popping up on your phone. Let's just say what I found there was beyond shocking. I'm obviously aware that racism is a pervasive issue worldwide. But to see it so blazingly displayed on this website was really upsetting. The site that Brian Smith apparently frequented and felt strongly enough that he wanted to share their articles all over his social media platforms turned out to be a neo-Nazi white supremacist website. It is honestly a cesspool of hatred. They post awful imagery and propaganda while proudly stating repeatedly their belief of a superior Aryan race, which is a very familiar phrase. And it's probably fitting that it's familiar because they also praise Hitler. This website uses racial slurs with the casualness that I would use the word the in a sentence. It is truly, truly vile. To top it off, they even have a whole gallery of their idiot followers' tattoos. And I'm just going to say, maybe you, maybe me, maybe someone should turn that over to the FBI because I bet some of those tattoos would match up with descriptions of wanted people. Again, just saying. And to really top off their disgustingness, they even sell merch. Because apparently, hate comes with a price tag. And for the low, low price of $14.99 plus shipping, you too can wear your bigotry for everyone to see. All right, I, I realize I'm getting a little off topic, but these were the sites that Brian Smith was posting and endorsing on his social media. These were obviously the beliefs that he held, that any other race other than white was inferior. So I don't want to rush to judgment, but Stephanie, if I married a man who posted that nonsense, I would be filing some papers in divorce court quicker than you can say irreconcilable differences. But that's just me. Back to Brian. He is in Alaska, and again, he's collecting odd jobs all over the place. Alaska Tire Service, Dow Engineers, and the Marriott Suites. In fact, he was just about to start a new position at the Residence Inn in Anchorage, which ugh, chills my bones to talk about because I've actually stayed there during high school sporting trips, and the thought that Brian Smith could be there greeting me, showing me to my room... 
absolutely not. No, thank you. In another statement to the news, his wife said something that really caught my attention. She said that while Brian was working with Dow Engineers, it took him all over Alaska to places like the rural villages of Iwanak, and new Stoya. I know I butchered those names and I practiced. I really did. I even called my dad who still lives in Alaska. I'm going to look up the pronunciation because I really do want to get this right. How to pronounce news. Um, <laughs> well, you got to find moments of levity, right? Um, I guess you can't trust the internet for anything. I do apologize. Again, I, I really do try my best with these pronunciations, but they are very difficult for me. She also said that he enjoyed adventuring all over Alaska's mountains in Turnigan Pass, Telkeetna, up to Montana Creek, going to the shooting range and taking those long drives. When I was growing up in Alaska, we referred to these small towns as bush towns, and that's not derogatory in any way. It just refers to towns and villages that don't have easy access to roadway or water transportation systems. And it's interesting to note that Imonek is a small bush town of around a thousand people. 93%, if not more, of the population is American Indian and Alaskan Native. Only 0.5% is white. As for New Stoyahawk, of its 510 occupants, 96.5% are American Indian or Alaska Native. If you've made it this far, you're probably thinking, okay, Elise, we have gone down a rabbit hole. Why are you talking about the statistics of the ethnicities of these bush towns? Why are you talking about him being a racist? How does any of this connect? It connects because Brian Smith, who held the belief that any race, any race beyond his own, was inferior, was the same Brian Smith who, by his own wife's statements, often traveled solo all around Alaska to these villages highly populated by native Alaskan people. He went on these solo adventures, exploring the mountains. This is the same Brian Smith who killed two native Alaskan women and disposed of them as if they were not even human. And it's honestly my opinion they are not his only victims. I think by the end of this episode, you will agree. In September of 2019, Valerie Kessler, an Alaskan woman who was experiencing homelessness and had turned to sex work on the streets of Anchorage, had the absolute displeasure of meeting Brian Smith. Brian had just gotten the U.S. citizenship that he so desperately wanted. In fact, he got it that same month. And with his wife out of town, he was looking to celebrate. He went around driving the streets of Anchorage until he picked up Valerie Kessler in his 1999 Black Ford Ranger. That's a truck if you're not a car girl. Valerie had packed a party favor of her own, a little bit of flavored vodka disguised in a Gatorade bottle. Valerie said the pair drove around for a bit before Brian pulled into a Shell gas station to pull money out of the ATM for their, let's just call it a date, shall we? While Brian was occupied outside of the vehicle, Valerie looked over, and what was in the center console? Silly Brian had left his phone behind, and with a bit of liquid courage from her incognito Gatorade bottle, Valerie probably thought to herself, hey, I could skip having to do all this stuff with this disgusting, grotesque piece of human trash. I'm paraphrasing, of course, but I could skip all of that. In fact, I could just take his phone and probably trade it in for some cash. And in that fateful moment, she made the decision to snatch his phone and make a break for it. What would be impossible for anyone to guess is the horror that Valerie would see when she powered up Brian's phone. And I had been like up drinking and getting high for like two weeks straight. Okay. So, and then I turned it on and I was like sober in like less than five minutes. What had sobered Valerie up so quickly was the phone's contents. His phone contained 39 photos and 12 videos depicting the brutal torture and murder of Kathleen Henry. Valerie was obviously horrified by what she saw, but she had to figure out what to do. She's in a bit of a pickle because she had stolen his phone after all, and she didn't want to get in trouble for that. 
So she came up with a plan. She goes into a grocery store and just puts the SD card right in her pocket and walks on out. And before you go judging her, consider this. She has little to no financial means. So she did what she had to do. And I think that we can all agree when faced with the potential consequences of taking a maybe $20 SD card in the hopes of catching a horrible murderer, we would all make the same choice. Or at least I hope you would. Valerie transferred all of the pictures and videos over to the SD card and then she scrawls on top of it, homicide at Midtown Marriott. And you gotta hand it to her. Valerie is not one to bury the lead, is she? <laughs> on the afternoon of September 30th, 2019, Valerie called the Anchorage police station. She's like, ring, ring. Um, yes, officer, I happened to find, just happened upon it on the road, an SD card, and I think you're gonna need to see it because it has videos of a murder. So I'll be here and I'll wait for you. And we can't blame her for telling a little white lie, right? She thought she was going to get in trouble for not only stealing the phone, but for soliciting sex. So she didn't tell the truth. And I don't blame her. Valerie honestly would become the most unlikely hero in the strangest of circumstances. What Valerie and now the Anchorage police saw on that SD card is something out of Satan's nightmares. In some of the photos, there was a naked woman lying on a carpeted floor. Her left eye was bruised, her lips were bloodied, and she had red marks over her entire face. In one video, a man, who is sure to keep his face out of the frame, slaps, beats, and strangles a woman, all the way taunting and ridiculing her. He steps on her throat, he steps on her stomach, poking her in the eye several times, and he touches her body in sexual manners, even going so far to pose her beaten and naked body for the camera. But it's his voice that haunts me. It's devoid of even a hint of empathy whatsoever. And it's the taunting of this woman that he's murdering that just, it, it truly messed me up. There are times that he patronizes her. Why won't you just die? Hurry up, I'm getting tired. He continued to strangle her, telling her that she needs to finish his movie positioning her in particular scenes he wanted to capture, asking her, do people need to be taught how to die? A hundred thousand years of evolution and you still don't know how to die. He then states, in my movies, everyone always dies. What are my followers going to think of me? People need to know when they are being serial killed. And to really drive home how little regard he has for the magnitude of the pain he is inflicting on this woman. He then tells her, you're effing up my drinking time. You're effing up my entire evening. Just take one for the team. Do you realize that I still will have to carry your sorry down to my car and dump you somewhere? I won't subject you to most of the actual audio, and I've done my best to remove all of the curse words and the sounds from the victim. However, I think it's crucial to hear excerpts from it because I want you to understand the depth of depravity that we're dealing with here. I want you to hear how comfortable this man, if you can even call him that, is with inflicting unspeakable acts of violence on this woman. And I want you to imagine, if you can, that these were the final words that you heard as you struggled to breathe. Yeah, I left it. That's it. Just do it. Just take it, swallow it. Just do a nimble shot while we hit your do like an angle, like an action shot. Okay, we did the nimble shot. You live. You die. You live. You die. You live. You die. Sadly. In my movies, everyone dies. Brian Smith continued to taunt Kathleen before he eventually strangled her to death. In the final video, the killer wrapped her dead body in a white sheet, puts her in a luggage cart, and wheeled her body down to a black truck. A black Ford Ranger truck, to be exact. It's that chilling voice that would end up being his ultimate downfall, because as the police officer watched these tapes... 
He recognized that voice. He remembered the accent. It's very distinctive. That voice matched a suspect named in a prior investigation. The suspect was Brian Smith. If you have your good listener ears on today, you're probably thinking, wait, hold up. You said he had no criminal history, and he didn't. There was not a whole lot I could find out about the prior investigation, except that a woman had come forward with information about Brian Smith. Unfortunately, the investigation did not go forward because that informant later unalived herself. But that police officer recognized that voice, and a new investigation was about to begin. Obviously, they're going to need more than just a voice that sounded like a man named Brian on a tape to convict him. And thankfully, Brian Smith, like so many criminals, was not as smart as he thought he was. The videos and pictures on the SD card were all time-stamped between September 3rd, 2019, and September 4th. And guess which Marriott employee rented a discounted employee rate room from September 2nd to September 4th? at that Marriott, Brian Smith. The fact that this man had aspirations of owning his own hotel, could you even imagine the horrors that would have taken place had he realized that dream? If you know the case of H.H. Holmes and the murder castle, that is what I'm imagining, that Brian Smith's hotel guests would check in and they would never check out. Because inside room 322, the carpets and furniture match those from the murder videos. And honestly, now that I say that out loud, we have to give Valerie even more credit because she was able to recognize the carpet and furniture enough to write the exact location on that SD card before turning it into police. But I also want to share some rather interesting text that Brian shared with a young man named Ian Calhoun that were wildly incriminating. I don't know how these creeps find each other. Like, is there a hangout for sociopathic, murderous, terrible humans? I'm in my 30s and I find it hard enough to find, like, make adult friends at this age, much less people that have this similar interest. But I do want to point out, Ian has not been arrested or convicted of any crime in this case. And I have to legally protect myself and say that while the evidence of their text was used in court, I can only say that it is my personal opinion that, allegedly, Ian is a real creep, and this deserves to be looked into a lot more than it has been. So let's go through their text, shall we? On September 4th, 2019, the day that police believe the murder took place, this is their text message exchange. At 12.54 a.m., Brian writes, he he, you up? I'm having fun. We're off to a disgusting start. At 7.08 a.m., Ian wrote, I was not up. Sounds like you were having a lot of fun. At 9.16, Brian responded, Hi, I did have fun. Wanted to share. Ian, we need to get together for a drink soon. Brian, are you anywhere near me today? Ian responded, What? I'm in Anchorage, yes, but I'll be working until four-ish. At 9.20 a.m., Brian said, I have something to show you, something I cannot keep for too long. At 3.36 p.m., Brian wrote Ian, I will be finishing at 4.30. Need to find a secluded spot to meet. Ian responded, okay, I should be off pretty close to then. At 4.46, Brian wrote, hee hee, I am at a small park close to your home. You finish work yet? He then sent a map pin to Forsyth Park in Anchorage, close to where Ian lives. At 4.53 p.m., Ian wrote, Give me one minute. These two were at this location for about 10 minutes together, per the phone evidence gathered by the FBI. And what do you think made Brian so eager to play show-and-tell with his creepy little buddy Ian? Could it be that at this time, the police believe that Kathleen's body was still wrapped in a sheet in the bed of Brian's truck. He did have a truck topper thing on it, but this man is so brazen that he is driving around the streets of Anchorage with the corpse of a woman that he had tortured and murdered. Not only that, but the police believe that he drove around with the body of Kathleen in the bed of his truck for two days. 
I imagine he probably wanted to sleep in those two days, and we know that he checked out of the hotel on September 4th, the day that the next morning, excuse me, after the police believe that she was murdered. So he must have had to go home, right? Go home to his loving wife while the tortured, beaten body of Kathleen Henry is laying in the bed of his truck, wrapped in a sheet in his driveway. On October 2nd, the beaten body of 30-year-old Alaska native Kathleen Jo Henry was found discarded along the Seward Highway. Her cause of death was later ruled as asphyxiation by strangulation. That same day, Brian and Ian had another interesting message exchange, but this time on Facebook Messenger. At 12.55 p.m., Ian wrote Brian. In fact, he sent a link of the KTUU news article about the human remains found on the Seward Highway near Beluga Point, mile 108. Click share article. Sent it right over to Brian. At 12.57, Brian responded, oops. Ian then said, as soon as I saw it, knew I should send you a text. Brian responded, I'm surprised it took so long. In a few weeks, snow would have covered it. Ian then said, I was kind of hoping that it would hurry and snow, but that means I'll be in the clear. At 1.20 p.m., Brian wrote him, there is something else I must tell. I will talk next week, but keep an eye on this about any leads. Can't talk, not alone. Everyone is upset that I am carrying my phone around on vacation. Ian said, gotcha, we'll get together soon. While Brian was on his little vacation, the police are putting all of this evidence together and they are ready to have a bit of a sit down with Brian. On October 8th, about six days after the remains of Kathleen Joe Henry were recovered, Brian Smith was flying home from his little vacation with his wife to the United States Capitol, where they took that photo. He stepped off the plane, and homicide detectives were there ready to meet him. Once they had him in an interview room, police start laying out just some of the evidence they have on him. They start with the pictures of Kathleen Joe Henry. And at first, wasn't me. He denied everything. Deny, deny, deny. Didn't do anything wrong. Well, officer, on second thought, sometimes I pick up a spicy worker to act out some rough sexual fantasies that I have a lot of, you know, a lot of people have those fantasies. I just wouldn't ever act them out with my wife. Some loving, doting husband he is, right? But then the police told them that they had an SD card with the videos and pictures on it, even playing him audio from one of the videos. And Brian needs to change his story. That's my truck. I did, that's my truck. That's my voice. That looks like my shoes. It's, I wear jeans usually. It looks like jeans in the picture. I honestly, I do not. I put a blank on. If that's me, I put a total blank. Something's blocking, blocking this out of my mind. That's what you came up with, Brian. I love when criminals really overestimate their genius because no one is buying his story of, I drank too much, I don't remember her, I've never seen her before in my life. Sorry, officer, I can't help you with any of this. So then they present him with more evidence. They showed him photos of Kathleen's body being loaded up into a black truck, a black Ford truck that just so happened to have a partial plate showing in the picture. That partial plate matched Brian Smith's license plate. And this is where Brian got real creative. He said he just woke up, he walked out of his hotel room, and found a dead body in his truck. Can you believe it? So, of course, he's in a panic. He went out and dumped the body so that no one would ever suspect him of any wrongdoing because he didn't do anything wrong. He just found the body. Sir, how dumb do you think these officers are? I know how dumb I think you are, but how dumb do you think they are? Because I personally know plenty of people who have had a wild night on the town, had a couple cocktails, maybe quite a few cocktails, and not one of those people have woken up and gone, whoopsie daisies. Guys, um, just went out to my car. Can anyone explain the dead body in my uh, trunk? Anyone? Um, I, I, I don't know how it happened. Can't remember. Cannot remember something so horrific as how a dead body ended up in my car. But Brian thought the police would believe this, and I have to give credit to the officer. 
I don't know how they conduct these interviews with a straight face sometimes because he didn't miss a beat. Detective Brandon Lee asks him, okay, that's your story. Interesting. Why would you not call? A reasonable person would call the police and say, hey, I found a dead body. What they wouldn't do is wait two days, keep the dead body in the back of their car, drive it home, park it in their driveway, and then take it out to a spot, not only dump the body over the guardrail, but then take the other stuff that belonged to the victim and take that and dump it in a different place. What does that look like? And then take pictures of her in the back of your truck. Nobody else could have done that. This back and forth with officers went on for hours, and he refused to confess, even though there was a mountain of evidence against him. So police officers are like, he's obviously not going to confess. We should get into the jail, process him. I mean, we've got a ton of evidence here. This is our guy. So they're starting to wrap up the interview. And Brian Smith says, um, excuse me, before we go anywhere, I need to pee. Got to have a little potty break. So he's escorted to the bathroom, and once in there, he turns to the officer who escorted him in and says, I'm going to make you famous. Chilling. And then he went back into the interrogation room where the officers had been interviewing him, and he turns to them and asks, are you in a rush? And my gosh, that... Oh, that just gives me goose pimples, even repeating that. Could you imagine what those officers are thinking? Of course, they're going to be like, no, we'll go ahead and sit back down. No rush at all. They had to think like, okay, this is it. Like we've worn him down. He's going to confess to the murder of Kathleen Henry. But boy, did they get a surprise of a lifetime when they settled back into the chairs in the interview room. And Brian Smith tells them that a while back, he had picked up a woman from the parking lot of a grocery store. He told the police that he offered her a warm meal and a place to sleep, which, come on, Brian, no one thinks you're a good Samaritan here. His wife was out of town, surprise, surprise, so he takes this woman back to his house. And then he gets annoyed with her after he asked her to take a shower and she refused. Okay, seems somewhat reasonable. I wouldn't want to shower at a stranger's house either. But Brian's response to a woman refusing to shower when he asked her to was to walk into his garage retrieve his pistol, and shoot her in the head while she lay completely unsuspecting on his couch. He admitted to officers it was unprovoked. She did not do anything. She just pissed me off. He told police that after he had murdered her, he took disturbing sexual images of her, then he covered her with a black plastic bag and drove her body in the back of his truck to a turnout on the Old Glen Highway. He offered to show them where he'd left her, but as it turned out, police did not need his help. Tragically, the skull of 52-year-old Native Alaskan Veronica Abuchuk had been found in April of that year by mushroom foragers. It was believed that she was killed sometime in August of 2018, the year before Kathleen. But Brian was not done there. He confessed he often picked up unhomed women for sex and partying, and that sometimes he paid them or... Other times he just got them so drunk that he took what he wanted for free. And Brian videoed these encounters and posted them on adult websites and had a whole online alter ego with the pseudonym Bradley Phillips. Police asked Brian if he had filmed Kathleen's murder for a snuff film. Snuff films, uh, for those that don't know, and I wish I didn't know, are videos of homicides, actual homicides of victims. They're sold on the dark web to the human equivalent of pawn scum. Brian denied that he he didn't want any part of sharing that online, but quite frankly, I don't believe that for a second because in the audio from his own videos, he mentions his followers and he had to pose her to get certain shots of her body as if he was trying to meet the demands of others, maybe someone online. Potentially. Brian wrapped up his unexpected confession by saying, I'm already going away for the rest of my effing life. One more thing isn't going to hurt me. Later, police would recover the gun that he had used to kill Veronica. 
They were also able to recover deleted videos and pictures that Brian had taken of her before and after her death. Carpet from his home was stained with blood matching the DNA of Veronica. They also found what we often refer to as a kill kit, a black bag with latex gloves, bleach, duct tape, things of that nature in his truck. They also found two homemade gun silencers in his home, as well as 10 phones, tons of SD cards, basically recording equipment galore at his home. Brian Stephen Smith was charged with 14 charges, including murder in the first degree, murder in the second degree, sexual assault, tampering with physical evidence, and misconduct involving a corpse, which refers to sexual penetration of a corpse. He pled not guilty to all charges and was held on a $2 million bond. Brian was brought to court to stand trial in February of this year. The courtroom was filled with local media, family members of the victims, and sitting behind her husband, Brian Smith's wife, Stephanie. I watched a lot of the live coverage, and I have to commend the judge, Judge Saxby, for a decision that he made. He said, quote, The videos and other images in general show a woman's final 35 or so minutes of life. They show her being strangled to death. She's obviously already been severely beaten by the point the videos are being taken, and she's being tortured and played with while she's dying. In addition to being robbed of her life, she's being robbed of her dignity, and I've concluded that I have a duty not to make the court system complicit in that, end quote. He ordered that a large screen would be faced away from the courtroom where the family members and media were. Only the jury, the attorneys, and Brian Smith could view the video. The audio would be heard by the rest of the courtroom. The audio was disturbing enough, so I really hope that that jury was provided with counseling after having to watch these videos. But I'm really glad that the judge chose to protect Kathleen's memory to the best of his ability during this trial. She was treated less than human in death, so I'm glad she got some respect during this process. As for Brian, he unfortunately also was allowed to watch the video. Of course, as the defendant, you are legally allowed to see all the evidence against you, but I just wish that he was barred from watching it somehow. Because while the jurors and people in the courtroom were visibly upset watching and or hearing this video, Brian sat with his hands folded in his lap without ever looking away, bowing his head in shame. If anything, to me, it appeared that he was mesmerized by watching his own brutality. When the evidence had been presented and closing arguments had been made, the jury only deliberated for two hours before returning their verdict of guilty on every charge. They also found him guilty of an aggravating factor because he had subjected Kathleen Joe Henry to substantial physical torture. Alaska doesn't have the death sentence, but the aggravating factor verdict imposes a mandatory 99-year sentence. So Brian Smith um, is supposed to be sentenced in July of this year, but it is safe to say that he is never going to walk free and instead will spend the rest of his miserable life unable to inflict this type of horror on anyone else. As for his wife, Stephanie, she told reporters that she plans to stay married to Brian and she's going to visit him in prison. She said, I said my vows. He was very good to me, but he had another life, I guess. And I don't don't want to keep harping on Stephanie, but I just, if you happen to listen to this, honey, he was not good to you. He was not only cheating on you, but while you were out of town, he was killing women in your home where you rest your head at night. You can do better. You really can. I've said throughout this episode that it's my belief that these are not Brian Smith's only victims. And I think there's been plenty of evidence throughout this case that that proves that. The audio in his videos implying that he had done this before to the comfort and almost bored demeanor he seemed to have while torturing and killing a woman. It's even implied at numerous points during the video that he is sharing these videos, that he's trying to get specific shots for his followers But not only that, he was gone for long stretches of time all over Alaska in rural areas where sadly many missing and murdered Native Alaskan women never get reported. I don't think it's a coincidence that this proven racist targeted vulnerable, unhoused Native Alaskan women. Is it that shocking that someone who held these hateful beliefs about any other race besides his own would assault and murder these Native Alaskan women 
and then dispose of them like they were trash to be collected alongside the highway. But it's one comment in particular. This was actually thrown out in court. Um, the judge told the jury to disregard it, but my ears perked up. <sighs> that really just this one comment had me really questioning just how many more victims there are. Detective Brandon Lee testified that he heard a jailhouse phone call between Brian Smith and his wife where she asked him if he had sex with the women he killed. He responded, not with those two. I hope that I'm wrong. I truly do. But if I'm not, then my hope lies in the fact that he's going to be in jail for the rest of his life. So if there are more victims that maybe they can be linked to him through DNA or maybe he's going to confess because not that I think that this man has any empathy for the victims or the victims' families, but I think he might want the notoriety or like he said in his first confession, he's going to be in a jail cell rotting away for the rest of his life. What's one more confession going to hurt him? We talked a lot today about the perpetrator of these crimes, but I want to conclude this episode by discussing the victims. Veronica Abachuk had a troubled life. In childhood, she reported that she had been molested, and throughout her life, she struggled with addictions. But she would do her best to reconnect with her family and her children when she was able. In 2005, Veronica's sister, Martha Tom's body, was found beaten under a picnic table in an Anchorage park. She would later die in the hospital, and her murder remains unsolved to this day. Veronica went through a lot of tragedy in her life and had her own demons, but her sister Margie described her as a real nice person who never cussed and didn't have a mean bone in her soul. Veronica deserved so much more than this callous end, murdered for not taking a shower when a man she did not know asked her to. Kathleen Jo Henry was born December 22, 1988 in Bethel, Alaska. She faced her own struggles with addiction, but was really excited to receive her GAD when she was incarcerated. She loved social media and often took to it to post about her excitement in receiving her GAD, her goals for the future, and to post her poetry. Some of her posts hinted at abusive relationships that she had experienced and her desire to get her life back on track. She would die before she would ever reach those goals. This case also highlights the national crisis of missing and murdered Indigenous women in this country. According to a report by the National Crime Information Center, in 2016, there were 5,712 reports of missing American Indian and Alaskan Native women and girls. But the U.S. Department of Justice Federal Missing Persons Database, called NamUs, only logged 116 of these cases, 116 out of almost 6,000. In 2018, the Urban Indian Health Institute listed Anchorage as one of the top three cities for missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. Alaska was also ranked fourth in having the highest number of missing and murdered Indigenous people deaths nationwide. Something needs to be done, and there is something you can do to help. I found a creator on TikTok with the username alaska.mmip, and she advocates for MMIP in Alaska, and she has been closely following this case. They've been holding protests for the police to look further into Ian Calhoun. Remember Brian Smith's little texting buddy? Ian was subpoenaed to testify in the trial against Brian, but in the very last moment, like really cutting it close, through his lawyer, he evoked his Fifth Amendment right to not incriminate himself and did not testify. It's my opinion that those text exchanges show that Ian knew what Brian Smith was up to, allegedly even arranging to see the body of Kathleen Henry in the back of Brian Smith's truck. And the Facebook message after her remains were found where Ian said, but that means I'll be in the clear. In the clear about what? And for what, Ian? And in order to not get sued on my very first episode back, since Ian seems to be a bit litigious, I want to remind listeners that this is just my opinion, based on public records and the evidence reported in the trial and documented on numerous media outlets. In my opinion, it's weird-ass behavior that should be looked into. If you think so, too, they've started a change.org petition that I will link in the show notes. And be sure to follow alaska.mmip on TikTok.
for developing updates on this case. Wow. Okay. That was a long one. Honestly, I'm happy to be done talking about this case because it has really haunted me. But if you hung in with me this long, thank you. It honestly feels so good to be back and sharing these cases that I think deserve attention, and hopefully we can learn something along the way. All of my sources for today's episode are listed in the show notes, but listeners, if there's a case that you want covered, be sure to submit it on www.caseofthesundayscaries.com. I really love hearing from you about the cases that you want to see covered because honestly, I've started a spreadsheet of cases that were submitted by listeners and many of them I wasn't aware of. So please, if you want a case covered, feel free to submit it on our website. And in the meantime, please do me a favor, hit the follow, hit the subscribe button on whatever you're streaming this episode on because I will be back next Sunday with another case that you won't want to miss. Please take care of yourselves, but as always... Until then. So as you guys can imagine, when I'm recording these episodes, my phone is in do not disturb. My every notification is turned off. Um, and I have an update. Sadly, it looks like I was right. And why I love being right, you can ask any of my exes. I really, really hoped that I was wrong about my suspicions in this case. I spoke at the end of the episode about Antonia, the TikTok user with the handle alaska.mmip. Well, I reached out to her. I wanted to get her consent before sharing her advocacy work on this episode. And it turns out, as they were requesting documentation, they stumbled across some troubling evidence. I'm just going to paraphrase the document and then share a video from Antonia's account because she deserves all the credit for doing so much work putting protests together, you know, putting pressure on the Alaska police and just advocating for Alaska MMIP in general. I can only say that I really hope this woman is identified and by some miracle we find out she is still alive. The document says Mr. Hunter, the person going through all the tech evidence, Mr. Hunter also located on Brian Smith's phone images of an unknown woman. The images all depict a female in dark clothing laying on the ground in an outdoor environment. Mr. Hunter indicated that the female had injuries to her face and may be unconscious or deceased. These photos had been deleted from Brian Smith's device. It's believed that these images were taken between September 16th and September 22nd of 2019. This would have been just roughly two weeks after the murder of Kathleen Henry, before Brian would go on his family vacation to Washington, D.C. And it turns out that they believe Brian Smith could have been staying in a hotel during this time as well, as there were pictures of an alarm clock on what appeared to be a hotel nightstand. I want to remind you that Brian Smith worked for a hotel during this time, and he had killed Kathleen in a hotel room. The document concluded by saying that because of all this evidence, it appears there may be an additional victim. Mr. Hunter went through 57 additional devices, thumb drives, phones, SD cards, etc., and determined that they all have information that could be relevant to this investigation. So again, please consider following Antonio's account on TikTok at alaska.mmip or their Facebook page they put together called Arrest Ian Calhoun Now to be kept updated on this case. I'm going to leave you with a video that she posted to her TikTok account when this document was released. We got some more paperwork about the unidentified woman that they found pictures of in convicted murderer Brian Stephen Smith's phone. I told you guys a couple of weeks ago that we were requesting paperwork and we got some more today. If you're not sure what I'm talking about, you can click on this comment here to go watch the video about the last filing that we found, but this one has more information. And after I tell you guys about it, you guys are probably gonna be a little bit like me and like, what what is APD doing? Literally, what is APD doing? Because this was filed on, it says right here, December 9, 2019, in the purple there, where I highlighted it. I, I made all these marks. But let's go through it. So the last video, I told you guys that APD found a picture of an unidentified woman that was laying outside on the ground. It was not the other two victims that have been identified, which were uh, Veronica Bochuk and Kathleen Jo Henry. So up at the top there, it says that they discovered a photograph depicting an unidentified victim who appears deceased. It says appears deceased. And she's located on her back in a grassy area. The photograph appears to have been taken at night and the victim has capri pants which are pulled down below her waist and marks on her face which could be bruising. And then right here it says that 
They interviewed him on October 8, 2019, and he was shown this photograph that they found in his phone. At the time, Smith said the words to the effect of, I thought I deleted that photograph. I should be more careful. He said that to APD, and they still have not identified this woman after he said that. Or even told the public about this unidentified woman and this convicted murderer's phone. And they're not even trying to ask for help, like finding out, one, if she's alive, if she's okay, why her picture was in this convicted murderer's phone showing that she was beaten. And they're, they're, just, they're just like, oh, it's fine. We don't need to know if she's alive or not. Anyways, let's get back to this. So it says that examiners have reviewed this photograph that was likely taken between the 16th and the 22nd of September and might have been taken between the time period of 1.38 a.m. and 7.08 a.m. on the 19th. APD forensic examiners also discovered a second photograph more clearly depicting the victim's face. In that photo, she appears to have substantial facial bruising and a swollen tongue, which could indicate beating and strangulation. To date, the victim has not been identified and it is not known if the person depicted is deceased. Oh my God. I have like zero faith in APD. So this was filed on December, 2019. And then that last filing that we showed you guys, that was filed on January, I think first or four of 2024. So this many years later, she still remains unidentified. I got a call back from a detective in the homicide unit and he told me that they still have not identified her. They have not tried to ask the public to help identify her. We're trying to get them to send that photograph to a forensic artist to draw a sketch in case this, this photo is too gruesome for the public to look at. But the least they can do is ask the public for help. Like, does anybody recognize this woman? Is she alive? That's all, that's all they have to do. And they're literally not doing it. This is the second page. Um, it goes through his um, map locations after they found that photo. And then they found that he was driving around in the, in the Eklutna area for a 30 minute round trip where he could have possibly dumped a body if a murder did occur. And just, oh my God, I just want to scream. I just want to scream. Anyways, I feel like we should all call APD and ask them who this unidentified woman is and why they are not trying to ask for our help in identifying her or even trying to find out if she's okay. Because her photograph was found in a convicted murderer's phone and they're just like, meh, it's fine.